Amen. Amen. I'd like to think that when we get to heaven someday, that we're going to have, since we're going to have all eternity, that part of that is going to be hearing some stories. You know, maybe someone will say, you know what, I was sitting at home watching this stream, or I was listening to the service going down the road in my car, and, and God just met me. And I, I think it was, let's see, what was it, January 14th, 2024. That's when it was. Maybe we'll meet those people. Wouldn't that be cool? Praise the Lord. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us something. Verse 12, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It, express, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. And we think about the Word of God, of course, we're talking about the printed Word of God, but not only that, also the rhema Word of God, the declared Word of God. It means that every time God speaks, there's power behind it. He spoke the world into existence, right? And, and just think about this, His Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what we spent Christmas season talking about. And I think... Well, probably we're going to get undecorated this year, but you know, you just hate to put it away. You know what I mean? But we talked about him, uh, what he accomplished for us, that the word became flesh. <coughs> you realize that he has placed his word in our mouths as well. That when we speak his word, not ours, but his, that, that the enemies have to, have to bow down. There's so much available to us as believers in Jesus Christ that we sometimes just let go. So we're going we're gonna to talk about the Word of God this morning and specifically about a certain passage. And if you will please stay with me. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to give you a chance to do a lot of this, okay? We're going to look at three different passages of Scripture and three different Gospels that all basic, say basically the same thing. And the purpose of this, this is something that you would expect more in a Bible study. And that's why I said, would you stay with me on this? How many are willing to? Okay, good. So, <clears throat> here's the thing. The Bible will survive investigation. The Word of God will survive investigation. There are things in the Bible that require some digging. There are translations of the Bible, many different ones. Uh, ever since the Bible was translated in, out of its original languages a long, long time ago, There are no original manuscripts of the Bible. In other words, there's no original copies of what was written down. And they didn't have copy machines and printing presses until really recent history. So those manuscripts were copied over a period of time. And some people don't like to talk about this. I don't know why it bothers them that there are differences in some of these manuscripts, nothing major. There are more manuscripts of the New Testament than any other written work. That's right. yep. yeah. So some people will have a, a couple copies of Plato and never ever doubt that what he wrote down was true. But there are so many people today who are just looking for ways to discredit God and the truth of His Word that they will pick. And they'll pick. And guess what? Unbelievers aren't the only people who pick at this. They, they, they pick so much that they create different sides. And, and they claim spiritual superiority because of the translation they read. Or the method of interpretation. And it, it's one of my soapbox issues. Let's not just ignore what we don't understand. Amen. The Bible will survive investigation. Yes, it will. Yes, so, the, the, the passage that we're going to look at today, uh, 
is going to look a little different. We're not going to read it off that screen. I know that's kind of hard to see. If you've never seen an original 1611 King James Version, that's what it looks like. You can go on Google and you can type in original 1611 King James. Let me know how that works out for you. <laughs> because uh, not only is it a different font, there are some different words. And that's, that's actually modern English. It's the early modern English. But then go back and, and look up Middle English and look up Early English. You won't even, you won't recognize it, Early English. So even though this is considered modern English, it's, it's hard to understand when you look at it. And I, I have no problem with the King James Version, don't get me wrong, but I cannot figure out how it became so sacred. It's not the first English translation and it's not the only one. So what happens is when you have these different translations of the Bible, if, if you're on social media long enough, somebody is going to post, the NIV took out this verse. Don't, don't fall for this mess. It's divisive. And I come against it in the name of Jesus. First of all, they didn't number the verses in the manuscripts, right? Here's what happened. Just to give you a brief, and this will help you understand what I want to get into. We're not going to stay in this whole thing. But we want to have good exegesis of the Word of God. We need to understand what it says, what it meant when it was first written, and what it means to us today, right? And what I see is way too much division and way too much spirit of criticism. Oh, my word. Some people think it's a spiritual gift. Criticism. You're wrong because, or they'll run into something that they don't quite understand and they'll just pick their favorite version. That way they don't have to deal with it. The Bible will survive investigation. So, uh, we're going to look at uh, the story of the healing of a demon-possessed boy. It's in three Gospels. It's going to be in Matthew 17, in Mark 9, and in Luke 9. So, through the years, the scribes and the translators that made copies of these manuscripts, most of them were absolutely devoted to getting everything just right. Okay. So, in this case, we're looking at the New Testament. So, the New Testament writers uh, recorded everything in Greek, but it's not today's Greek, it's Koine Greek. And it was the language of the world as far as official, not so much always communication, but when something was recorded officially, it was the Koine Greek. So, Someone would be copying a manuscript, and something may, may stand out at them. And I believe the Holy Spirit was an agent in translations, too. Something may stand out at them, and they'd make a little note in the margin. You have Bibles that have notes, right? Some of the, the, uh, the uh, maybe the King James, New King James especially, will have center notes. So if you're reading a verse, you can go over and find where it appears elsewhere. Those are really good ways to study, even if you don't have a study Bible. Look at those notes, okay? So what happens is, down the road, somebody else would make a copy, and they might insert what's in the margin into the text. And then somebody else would come along, and they'd find some older manuscripts, and they'd realize, no, wait a minute, this doesn't appear here. And they would feel very compelled I can't put that in the text. I don't feel that that's right. And then fast forward to today when we have so many English translations and so many people who are unwilling to dig in and learn and they start getting critical. The NIV took out that verse. No. I don't mean to shock anybody. But the King James put that in. I'm not knocking the King James. It's great. Uh, and most of these translations have a, a, a lot to add. So when we see verses that aren't there, or when we see notes, that we'll see sometimes some manuscripts don't include. Yeah. Understand that since there's no originals, we don't have the very papyrus that, that Luke wrote on for Luke and Acts. <laughs> it's been copied. We have to understand that there are slight differences. But you know what? None of these differences take anything from the truth of the Word of God. 
So don't get in these arguments by people who just want to stir something up. It's bad enough when unbelievers want to stir something up. Don't let believers entice you into that. Because it's one of those hills I'm willing to die on. So, the healing of the demon-possessed boy, we're going to look at uh, a good example out of Matthew 17, where we see a, a, a verse in brackets. Now, if you ever read your comments and notes in your Bible, it'll say, some newer translations omit verse 21. You know what newer is? Well, 1901, for example, the ASV. 1901, that's a newer translation. So the, 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 a, us, the American Standard Version, they call it the, the American King James. But it's still very wordy and hard to understand. So there's a newer translation that took the ASV and made it easier to understand. You know how new that was? 1971. So this stuff didn't just happen last year, okay? Um, so we're going to use the NASB, the New American Standard Bible this morning, uh, 1971. Now it doesn't come, understand too, these are translations, these aren't paraphrases. This did not come from the King James Bible, this came from Greek manuscripts, okay? So I'm going to read, first of all, just this passage here, and you see it on your screen. Uh, then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. And verse 21, but this kind does not go out by prayer, but by prayer and fasting. I don't think anyone could argue with that statement, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And we're going to dig into this a little bit more, that there are things required of us as believers in Jesus Christ that are not always easy. It requires a bit more from us. So keep that in mind, because that's really what we're going to end with. But I want to take some time and, and dig through some of this kind of stuff. See, the, the older manuscripts that were found after, for example, the King James was translated, they found some that predated and are considered to be more reliable. A lot of them don't include that. Or, or the, word, the words and fasting that are found in Mark 9, 29, that is uh, Mark's version of the same event. So, so what do we do? Whenever we see something like this, what, what do we do? Do we just close the Bible and give up? Do we get all militant and pick a version that says what we think it ought to say? Or how mama taught us to memorize or all those things? Do we just pick that and then get critical of everybody else? No. We got to dig into it. Yeah. Some things require some digging. So let's back up. That's the first thing we do. When you see something that seems to be different in different accounts, the first thing to do is just start backing up and, and look at the scripture where it is, what surrounds it, what's going on. How do we, why do we do that? Well, that way you understand that we're talking in the same context, right? Yeah, a good example of how this works. Let's say I make the statement, I went to the store and somebody else says about what I did, they say, well, he went to the grocery store. And yet another person says, well, he went to the giant, and it was a Monday. And then finally I come out and say, well, I went to the produce, produce section of giant on Monday at 4 p.m. It's all true, right? We've established that it's all in the same context. You can't take a verse of Scripture here and take a verse of Scripture here and say, hey, they're saying two different things without understanding the context in which it's placed. And just to make you feel better, if someone is challenging you that, that the Word of God is, is false, that none of this stuff ever happened, and they pick, do that, they pick a verse here and a verse there, can I give you a little bit of relief? You're not obligated to argue with them. Amen. You're just not obligated to. 
You're not obligated to attend every argument you're invited to. Especially someone who's never read the Bible and opens it up and finds something. Because people will do that. Don't, don't let it happen to you. You don't have to. Oftentimes I will say, come back when you've read it all. And I'll be happy to talk. So, of course, you can't say that unless you've read it all. But I hope that a lot of you have. So, let's compile some information from the greater passages here. Uh, there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels because uh, they are similar. They tell a lot of the same things, okay? Uh, most of the time, they're the same event, but it's, it's, it's reported through different eyes. That's why we get different information, just like going to the store analogy that I told you about. Uh, John, of course, is a Gospel. There are some things that appear in all four. Uh, mostly, John uh, has some interesting, fresh things, a different perspective. So, a lot of times we don't see uh, things in all four, but a lot of times we see them in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So, here's some things that are true. The encounter with this demon-possessed boy came after this experience on the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus took Peter, James, and John and took them up the mountain. and. While they were there, in front of them, Christ was glorified and appeared alongside Moses and Elijah. And of course, Peter, that we can all identify with, blurts out, this is cool, let's build a memorial. You know, how many genuine revivals have been messed up by building something, you know, that you can see and touch? So, of course, Peter, we got to give him some grace, and we've all said things like that. But that's, that, in every account, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that precedes what happens with the story that we're going to look at today. Uh, Luke says it was the next day when this happened. The rest of them just say after. Well, guess what? The next day is still after, right? So Luke gives us a bit more information the next day. All of them say that there was a large crowd assembled. Mark says that in that crowd there were some scribes arguing, religious people arguing. Well, that's pretty easy to believe. Uh, Matthew's focus is on the man that came up to Jesus and it says that he fell at his feet. All three of them include this man who is the father of this boy who is possessed by a demon. So the man comes and reports on his son's condition. In Matthew, we learn that he is a lunatic, is the word that's used in the NASB, and very ill. And the word that's translated ill can mean miserable. So that sheds some new light. They, they say he's a lunatic and he's very miserable for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. Mark's version of what happened says that the boy was possessed with a spirit which makes him mute, unable to talk, and, and also seizes him and slams him to the ground. And it says that this boy foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth. And the NASB says stiffens out. If we look at that, literally, it's withered and dry. It leaves him totally spent, right? And it says, uh, Mark's Gospel also said it's been happening since he was a child. Luke adds the information that this is his only son. And that our spirit seizes him and that he screams suddenly. That he goes into convulsions and that he foams at the mouth and that it only leaves him with great difficulty, and that, it, that the Spirit mauls him. The word can be translated, crushes him as it goes. So, if we were to line all three of these up next to each other, and if we were only to believe the descriptions that were common to each one, you know what we'd know about this boy? We'd know that he was seized by a Spirit and foams at the mouth. And we would miss what we need to understand about this. Because when you look at that verse and says, this kind comes out only by prayer and fasting, you might say, well, what's the big deal? These disciples delivered people from demons before. What's the big deal about a demon that seizes a boy and makes him foam at the mouth? But when you understand and we add all of this information together, we understand that this is not your ordinary demon. This may even be more than one. We don't want to read into it, but, but 
this, this demon has this boy, and not only does he have a hold of this boy, he's had a hold of him since he was very, very young. Instead of just limiting our understanding, here we have three witnesses that agree on the existence of this young boy after the experience that Jesus had with Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. So as we kind of stand back and look at this, we have, we have three in agreement that give us a timeline, they give us the, the event, the, the, the boy who exists, and the father who was trying to get help for his boy. So, here's what we can learn by combining all these. This man's only son had lived his whole life under the control of an evil spirit that made him act like a lunatic, seized him, and made him miserable, made him hurt himself in multiple ways, manifest physically by making him foam at the mouth, grind his teeth, and that he becomes withered and dry and crushes the boy when it reluctantly leaves him. So we gain a whole much better understanding of what was going on here. All the gospel writers state that the disciples couldn't cast out this demon. That's another commonality. They were unable to. Matthew's gospel doesn't immediately speak of the fact that there is a demon. He, the father calls him a lunatic. And that can mean epileptic or that can mean someone who's moonstruck. Lunatic, lunar, that's where we get uh, the same words. Mark and Luke identify the cause right off the bat as a demon. Jesus in all cases, becomes frustrated, and he speaks firmly. What an interesting combination. Isn't it interesting to think that Jesus got frustrated, and he still does? <laughs> he says, the unbelieving and perverted generation. How long shall I be with you and put up with you? That phrase, put up, literally means, how long must I hold you up? How long do I have to keep telling you what you can do? And you know what? We got to say, you know what? For the disciples, the apostles, this was before Calvary and before Pentecost. So, watch our attitude about them, because we're just like them. And we have the benefit of being on the right side of history, right? But he says, how long shall I lift you up? Mark's gospel gives more insight in the boy's father. The last part of verse 22, he says, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And I just, I, I, I could hear Jesus. Can't you hear him saying, if you can? Come again, if I can do something. <laughs> and then the father comes back with a great statement of transparency. He says, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Oh, man. Can we all agree to be that transparent with one another? I do believe. Lord, help my unbelief. I do believe this to be true. I do trust. Help me in my doubt. Luke's gospel says that Jesus asked the man to bring his son to him. And as he did, the evil spirit threw the boy to the ground, threw him into a convulsion. All three gospels describe how Jesus rebuked the demon. Matthew eventually does call it a demon and cast it out. Mark's gospel gives the most information about Jesus' words, which is fascinating because Mark is one of the briefest gospels. But in this case, it gives us more information. Verse 25, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. He called it by name. He did not say, O oh, heavenly Father, thou who is going to raise me from the dead. Would you please move this demon? They even said, you miserable, rotten, stinking demon. Get out of this boy. And you know he did. 
We read through the gospel accounts that Jesus ministered. He declared. He said, get out of there. He said, be healed. He said, rise up and walk. And when we start reading through the book of Acts, and we see after Pentecost, when the believers were empowered, they did the same thing. Silver, look at me, silver and gold have I not, but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Huh? Jesus said, you deaf and mute spirit. He named it, right? I don't know that we always have to name the spirits. Jesus knew what it was. I command you to come out. Call it by name. I just love this attitude. I think sometimes we need to adopt this attitude when we feel like things are happening around us and we feel so decrepit. We feel so powerless. And we get a hold of it like that song, I am who he says I am. It's okay to out loud say, you dirty, rotten, filthy, stinking devil, demon, get out of my life. Amen. And I think sometimes we have to do that. You know, we don't hate other people, but we're, we're certainly entitled to hate the, the, our enemy and his, his demons. Yes. There's no hope for them. They cannot be saved, right? People can be saved. We don't speak to people like that. But if we don't within us let that, let that thing boil up that it comes from down here and we say, you dirty, rotten, lying, thieving enemy, get out. Man, I think we could do a whole lot rather than going, oh, please do what you said you would do. Give me a break. And Jesus' attitude, I love it. And what happened? The demon came out. <laughs> Mark, again, records more information. Verses 26 and 27. After crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out. And the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him up. And he got up. Sometimes when these demons go, they try to create as much havoc as they possibly can. But you got to keep pushing through that. Huh? Yeah. You got to keep pushing through that. Yeah. Only Matthew and Mark ind indicate that the disciples came to Jesus privately afterwards and said, why couldn't we do it? Luke tells us something else. The people were praising God, right? Everything looked good. Everybody was excited. You know, sometimes when you stand for the Lord and you do some things like this, people are going to say, yay, God. And Jesus said, I want you to listen to their words and let them sink deep into your heart because the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. The same people that cheer you on one day will criticize you the next. Jesus answered the question differently in Matthew and Mark. It gets to the bracketed verse in Matthew where we started out, verse 21, and, and the dilemma that many face over this. 20 and 21, and he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith, in answer to their question why they couldn't cast it out, for truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. And then the bracketed verse, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Mark 9, 29 says, and he said to them, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. Well, Mark's gospel was written first, and perhaps words were put into the uh, margin of a manuscript. Maybe that's how it ended up in Matthew. It doesn't make it any less true. And fasting was added on. So when faced with these dilemmas, as I mentioned before, it's best to step back. And sometimes you've got to step way back. Let's look at the things that we know to be true. The event occurred. Mm -hmm. And we know that it occurred on the day after the experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. Mm -hmm. We know those to be true. We know that no one but Jesus could cast out this demon and this boy. We know that the disciples were perplexed, wondering why couldn't we do this? Listen, they had done this already. They had already done this. Matter of fact, in Luke's gospel, uh, Luke 9 chapter 1 is the record of when he sent the 12 out and gave them all kinds of authority. 
And he said part of the list he told them they could do was to cast out demons. So they had done this already. They had already experienced, they knew what it was like to take authority over these situations. So what was the difference? Well, Matthew 17 tells us, he says, the littleness of your faith. That was the difference. That was why they couldn't cast out the demon. The littleness of your faith. Do you know that the whole phrase comes from one Greek word that only appears here and nowhere else in the New Testament. And it means of little faith or of trusting too little. And in context, I think trusting too little is the key. And I'll tell you why. Jesus had already said that this mustard seed faith is all you need. Just a little tiny bit. So why would he turn around and say, first of all, you don't have enough of it, and then turn around and say, all you need is a little bit to move a mountain. And I guess you could ask, what's easier, moving a mountain or casting a demon out of a boy? They're both pretty major undertakings. I think we can really best understand it by trusting too little. And when we trust too little, we call that unbelief. My God can do anything, but he probably won't. There are a lot of people that sit on pews and come into this building and come into other buildings that look like this who kind of take that attitude. They get very defensive about God and what he can do. But when you start talking about what he will do, there's a big disconnect. It's called unbelief. Now, we don't get to name and claim everything that suits our fancy. And I know that their word of faith movement, that the, in, its, in, its, in its genuineness, I think is a biblical concept. And the extremes is, I am believe in God for a half a million dollar house because he said that anything if I ask in faith, believing, I can speak it and I'll have it. And that's certainly not a biblical attitude of faith. But when God has already told us the things that we can believe for, and we don't, that's littleness. That is trusting too little. So that was the answer to the disciples. Why couldn't they cast it out? Because of unbelief. Mark 9, verse 29, Jesus' answer is recorded like this. This kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. Now, this kind is a word that's used there as we speak of genealogies, like family, this tribe, this type. So this demon was of a aggressive kind. And Jesus says this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. But does that mean they could have cast it out if they would have stopped and prayed first? Well, in a way, yes, and in a way, no. Simply coming before God and saying, God, please cast out this demon. I don't believe that that's the kind of prayer that Jesus was talking about. I believe he's talking about a consecrated life that is in continual prayer. That we are depending upon him for everything and understanding the source of our strength, and it comes as we come together in prayer. Jesus was so upset when he turned the tables of the money changers over in the temple, and he said that, that the word says that zeal for God's house consumed him. And he said, my father's house should be a house of prayer. And somehow we can talk about anything else but prayer especially if there's food involved and everybody comes. You say, we're going to make this a house of prayer and about 1% on average, I don't mean here, on average, 1% of people will come to a prayer meeting who come to a Sunday morning. Jesus said, this kind does not come out apart from prayer. So, why was and 
why do we have and fasting added? Well, the best manuscripts don't add it, but I think it was certainly understood. Why fasting? Start talking about that last week. Why fasting? Because it denotes a setting apart of the usual. It means that if you really want to be the bold believers in Jesus Christ that can stand right in front of the demon and say, you dirty, rotten, stinking demon, get out. That we don't do that on a whim. We don't do that with fear, except for obviously the fear of God, the healthy fear of God. That if you are going to be used in in that way, if you're going to dig and expect God to do the deeper things, you're going to have to put in some time. You're going to have to put in some time. And fasting certainly goes along with prayer. If you expect to be a world changer and free other people that are bound by the worst kind of demonic activity, you've got to be willing to pay the price. You must be all in for Jesus. And, and if you desire to be increasingly sensitive to the powerful principalities that seek to oppress you and, and control those around you, you have to be willing to forsake all. And sometimes that shows itself in fasting. I am so serious, and I want more of God. I'm willing to put aside the one thing that can be maybe the hardest, one of the hardest things to put aside, and that's eating. Because when I set that aside, I'm going to commit myself to going that much deeper. I'm going to dig a little bit further underneath. I'm going to investigate the Word of God. I'm going to put in some time rather than just going, oh, I don't know what that is. I'll just pick this version because I like it better. No, figure out why. Dig in, understand it. Because look what happens when you do that. Like we did this morning, we're gaining all kinds of insight that we can safely draw from this without adding anything back in. You've got to be willing to see, eliminate the distractions of the world. And the distractions don't have to be sinful. They just have to be distractions. You need to understand how Satan seeks to affect your mind. Oh, doesn't he do that, especially when you're fasting. Oh, rumble. I know what would fix that rumble. But I'm willing to discipline myself to put away the distractions. Every time we do that, we say to the enemy, get out of my mind. Get out of my mind. We eliminate these distractions and we understand the voice of our enemy we start to understand the kind of authority that Jesus operated in and the authority that Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension paid for us to walk in. Now, if we're okay with adding and fasting, and I am, I don't think that's a reach. If that ended up in a margin and it wasn't part, I don't think it's a distortion of what Jesus is saying here. Because certainly we pray every day, and when we enter into a season of deep prayer, fasting is often part of that. So I think it's perfectly acceptable to have the phrase, and fasting. But let's add a couple more things. This kind cannot come out without prayer and fasting and worship. Because when you worship God, you, you take your flesh and your mind, and you, you sit it under the authority of God. When you worship God, you're not focusing on your problems and, and your goals and your, all of these things. You are simply magnifying God for who He is, for what He's done, for what He means to you. So we could add worship. We could also add prioritizing the distractions, our time, and our money, and our activities, and our allegiances. We could also add the fellowship of the saints, or the exercising of our spiritual muscles. Challenge yourself to greater faith. Willingly put yourself in situations where you have to trust God. Man, oh man, that will, that will just... That can set you free from fear. 
It's one thing to be in a particular circumstance that you don't want to be in and to say, God, help me through it. It's another thing to say, Lord, I believe you're calling me to go here where I know I'm going to be uncomfortable, where I know I'm not going to be able to rely on my talents and abilities, and I'm going to have to trust you. Put yourself in situations where you have to trust God. It gets rid of your excuses. And then reading his word. Digest it. Examine it. Investigate it. Don't worry. It'll hold up under investigation. And we say, well, I just can't understand it. That's a lie from the pit of hell. I don't have time. Another lie. I'm not smart enough. Three lies from the pit of hell and still counting. Satan would love for you to think all those three things. Listen, we don't become fearless warriors for Christ by just thinking about it. If we're not capable to walk into these kind of battles in our flesh, well, if we can't discipline our flesh to do certain basic things, what happens when more is required of you? And I guarantee you, as you step in to your relationship with the Lord by faith into these deeper things, more will be expected of you. Not because God wants to make you miserable, but because He wants to make you shine. He wants to show you what you're capable of when empowered by the Holy Spirit. I have conversed with people who do everything they can not to grow in Christ and complain about their miserable situation. And I got to tell you, I'm not usually one to lose my patience, but I do, honest, being transparent, I lose my patience there. Why is everything going so bad? And they do everything they can to stay away from other believers. Or not read the word. Can't even show up where the other believers get together. If you can't endure some physical pain for heavenly gain, you're just not hungry enough. And I think as a general rule, and I've been guilty of this myself, you can say, well, it's going to be hard to get people to come along to do this. Maybe I'll just back off a little. I don't think I'm supposed to do that. I think it's calling all of us. And when I call you to deeper life, I'm calling myself at the same time. It's the first thing on my mind when I get up in the morning. It's the last thing on my mind when I go to bed at night. There have been some things on my mind in between there that shouldn't have been on my mind. Grab a hold and take that thought captive, right? But I'm not happy to coast. I'm just not happy to coast. I'm more excited about ministry now at 60 than I was at 20. Are you willing to discipline yourself to be hungry for the right things? Mark's version of the Great Commission. Mark 16, 15 to 18. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and been baptized shall be saved. He who has disbelieved shall be condemned. These signs will accompany those who have believed in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. This is not a snake-handling church. I do not advise you to go out and drink poison. But I believe firmly that what this is saying is, if you have to, it's possible for you to do that without being harmed. If you accidentally drink poison, some people maybe think water is poison, I don't know. But if you drink poison accidentally and you're, you're seeking to follow God, certainly that we can face those kind of things. But I, I just love it. These signs will accompany those who have been to Bible college. No. These signs will accompany those who've been ordained. This sign will accompany those who are evangelists and travel the world. No, those who have believed. How many believers do we have here today? Do you see that this is God's perfect design? This is what Jesus came and died for? That we could be used like this. Team, would you come? We're going we're gonna to close in a song. This is what God has created us and recreated us to do. But listen, it takes some digging. It takes some investing. 
it takes some investigating. Sometimes we miss our breakthrough by this much because we go, oh, well, I'm tired. We don't work for anything. It's not our works. It's, it's our heart. It's what we're devoted to. And as we are in this period of time where a number of us are fasting in different ways, um, this seemed like a perfect way to encourage you. When you fast, Jesus gave instructions, didn't he? He didn't say if, he said when. When you fast. And one of the things he said was, don't tell everybody about it. Don't look all miserable. And we could apply that to anything. When you're believing for your healing, you stand up as straight as you can walk. Not, oh. when, when, you, when you can't quite seem to get breakthrough, you, you, you walk in faith and say, thank you, Lord. I don't know how you're going to do it. When you seek to understand the Word of God, and the first thing that happens when you look at it is you go, uh, press past that. There's stuff online for free. Of course, you gotta, you got to weigh it, right? Because lots of opinions. I got books upon books upon books. We've got commentaries. We've got all kinds of stuff available to us. Take the time to dig. It's not just for pastors who have to preach a sermon. It's for believers in Jesus Christ who want to be all that God is calling them to be. Amen.